Well, thank you for inviting me to come this afternoon. Uh, it's always a privilege to uh, talk about birds. And I, I got to figure this thing out for a second. Which button was the laser? Oh, it's the center. The oh, it's the center. Okay, that would be great. So anyway, I did teach biology in Deer Lodge for 25 years. I actually taught biology in a room I took it in as a high school student. <laughs> and uh, my wife graduated in the spring and came back, was it the next fall? A year later as a faculty member's wife. So uh, we are very invested in Deer Lodge and uh, on my side of the family I was a third gen, my kids were the third generation to go to Powell County High School and on my wife's side it was four generations that went to Powell County High School. So we got really stuck in a rut and then my oldest daughter moved to Madagascar. So <laughs> things, things really change. But anyway, uh, I want to talk to you about bird diversity on the Clark Fork River. As many of you know, and I'm going to do a little review because I'm not sure if everyone's in the same place, but uh, the Clark Fork River is being remediated at the present time. It's not being restored, and you need to understand there's a difference between restore and remediation. Remediation says we're getting it back to something that's reasonable. Restoration means you got it all the way back and that's not possible. And uh, so Department of Environmental Quality hired me to do surveys on a number of points in the Clark Fork River so that they could get some data on what's happening with the birds. Other people are doing water analysis, etc. We're from one to three years into this research, which means we don't have enough data yet to really know what's happening, but in general, we're finding that there are no new species, and I'll suggest to you why that's true a, as we go through this presentation, but the richness or the number of individuals within species is increasing. Uh, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. And then I've got, okay, here we go. All right, so um, is that the next slide? Yeah. Okay, in late 1800s and early 1900s, the Clark Fork River carried mine waste from mining, milling, and smelting uh, down through the valley. And then in May of Ju in June of 1908, we saw record rain and snow in the upper Clark Fork Basin, and it breached many of the containment ponds uh, in the upper Clark Fork, and all of that stuff started moving downstream. Now, I grew up in Deer Lodge, so I thought a river that ran red some days and green other days was natural. My parents taught me that you don't go down to the river because the river's toxic, and that's the kind of environment I grew up in. In fact, when I was, uh, went off to high, uh, college in 1963, there were studies done on kids in Deer Lodge and Anaconda who left the valley to go to college, and there was evidence that we went under arsenic withdrawal symptoms. That's how bad things were at that time, but it was just kind of what it was. Well, anyway, all these uh, tailings came down the stream and they covered some 10,000 acres of land, mostly between Butte and Garrison. And one of the reasons that it got so extensive was that ranchers were irrigating out of the Clark Fork River and all this material came into the ditches and some of it landed several miles from where the river is. So the impact of what happened in that uh, flood was probably larger than uh, it might have been had things been different. Well, the Anaconda Company responded in 1911 through 1916 and built the Warm Springs Ponds, uh, better known back in the history as the Settling Ponds, and then they rebuilt them in 1959, and what they did in 1959 was simply raise the dikes so that if the wind blew, things didn't get stirred up quite so much. But Toxic water still flowed from the Butte Mines to Warm Springs until 1983. And then in 1983, uh, we began to see some real efforts in the Clark Fork uh, to clean these uh, streams up. And as, as a kid, I remember the river running red through our valley just like this. And nobody really thought anything about it. And in those sediments, that were in those, those contaminants were cadmium, copper, zinc, lead, arsenic. The river bottoms were cemented by the heavy use of lime. They used lime to try to precipitate these things out. And I can remember as a kid going down to the river and you could kick the gravels like this and pieces like this would pop up. 
because the river bottom was totally cemented. And if it's, of course, cemented, there can be no opportunity for invertebrates to be in there and uh, consequently not very many fish. Um, the other problem was a, there was a constant slow return of heavy metals into the river uh, going on all the time. And then in the summertime, when we had severe thunderstorms and heavy runoff, these runoffs would come back from the alluvial plain and dump in the river. And I can remember fish kills where thousands of fish floated down the river upside down. And it was simply because all of this stuff was in the alluvial floodplain. So uh, we, there's the state uh, in negotiations or suing or whatever you want to say, negotiated with the Anaconda Company. And three years ago, we began to clean that up. And that cleanup was called Reach A. It was 43 miles of river between Warm Springs and Garrison. Now the actual distance between Warm Springs and Garrison is um, 11, 28 miles. So you can see the river does meander quite a bit. And the uh, agencies that were responsible for overseeing this was the Montana Department of Quality, the Montana Department of Justice, the Montana Natural Resource Damage Program, the National Park Service. The only reason they were involved is because of the Grant Corps' historic site in Deer Lodge, and then the EPA. The settlement uh, was the settlement was reached in 1999, and the settlement was from the confluence of Silver Bowl Creek downstream of the ponds and water from Willow Warm Springs Creek. If you go just below the ponds, the water out of the ponds meets the water from Warm Springs Creek, and that is the beginning of the Clark Fork River. And from there to Missoula, they uh, made a settlement. And the state of Montana received $230 million, EPA received $95 million, and the Natural Resource Damage Program received $78.5 million. So three years ago, which had been 19, uh, 2015, we actually started moving dirt. But here's the problem they ran into. There's only $77 million left in this fund. And the work is supposed to take place from Warm Springs to Missoula. Within reach uh, A, only eight out of 44 miles have been cleaned. So we've only cleaned eight miles out of the distance to Missoula, and we've spent the majority of the money. So the, so the whole thing has been scaled back. They did a beautiful job of what they did, but now they're trying to figure out how can we com complete this. I, I have heard, and I can't confirm it, that they've tried to renegotiate with the uh, uh, parties involved, and the parties said, you know, if you miscalculated, that's your issue, not ours. Here's the problem the cost of hauling this dirt out and then hauling new dirt in has escalated astronomically since they negotiated this. And we're now doing Grant Coors Ranch and they tried to find a rancher in the valley who would make a depository on their property. Who wants heavy metal soils on their property? So now they're hauling the soil from Deer Lodge back to Anaconda to the Opportunity Ponds Repository. Think of the amount of diesel fuel that takes. Diesel fuel is breaking this project. Whoops. Let me go over here. How come that happened? I'll, it, it won't take a second to get it back. Yep. Okay. Oh, I know what I'm doing. See, when you use somebody else's equipment, uh, this, yeah, I got to hit the right button. There we go. So this is a typical example of uh, the river. And here's the river meandering through the Deer Lodge Valley. All of these areas here are slickens. Those are areas where the concentration of heavy metals is so high that there's no vegetation. There is some vegetation, and I'll talk about that just a little bit later, but you can see if you had a torrential rain storm, that water would rush across here and add heavy metals. This is an area that they're beginning to work on. All of this area from here to here is the distance that they've determined that they can remove the heavy metals and clean the river up. 
Okay? But are there heavy metals out here? Probably. But that's why I said restoration rather than restoration. Did I say that right? Remediation rather than restoration. But I, I want to show you something here. The valley's never going to recover until we get a cottonwood repairing zone again. This is dry cottonwood creek that comes out of the uh, east side and then it flows into the Clark Fork. What do you notice? Cottonwood repairing zone and it stops right at the heavy metals. Cottonwoods are very sensitive to these heavy metals and so after they uh, restored all this, then they've, then they've got to get the kind of plants in here, including cottonwood, that is going to restore this to what the valley looked like. The next time you drive from here to Missoula, watch the Clark Fork River. You won't see any cottonwood show up until you get to Garrison, where the water that came out of the little Blackfoot polluted, uh, diluted material enough that you begin to pick up a few trees, and then by the time you get to Drummond, the Cottonwood Gallery is back again. And that's what is going to have to happen all the way up the valley for us to actually get this to be restored. Gary, before you go too far, um, and if you're going to address my questions, just ignore them until you get to what you want to go. Um, you were given oh, about $350 million. You only got eight miles. In the first reach. Do you see any possibility of more money to actually do the project? Is no. That's the simple answer. I think we. I think the state's up against a real problem. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the cottonwoods that were coming down and just kind of stopped at where the tailings were. Um, my experience with cottonwoods and aspen is that cottonwoods are much more sensitive to to tailings, and aspen, on the other hand, will only need about maybe five to eight inches of soil. So I'm thinking maybe where cottonwoods wouldn't work, aspen, which are uh, uh, right. a subspecies, right. a species of cottonwood uh, poplars, uh, maybe they would work. Any, yeah. Any thoughts about that? Well, you know, I'm not. Uh, because I worked on the, on the bird side of it, I'm not really privy to what uh, the seed mixes were out there. I know there was a lot of shrubbery put in, a lot of salix, a lot of different willows. Uh, there's, some, there's some aspen that I've seen put in, a Wells cottonwood, juniper, uh, no gymnosperms to speak of other than juniper. But it's just going to take time to see what happens. And if you, have you ever planted a tree in your yard and it died? Lots of, lots of this stuff is dying, you know, so it's going to be interesting as, as we go down the road to see. Well, there's, there's uh, a number of phases. Phase one and two was state property, and they did that uh, first. We've got three years of remediation uh, work on it, and I have three years of surveys in that area. The Lampert Ranch, there's no remediation yet, and I've got three years of surveys in that area. Phase five and six is the Clark Fork Coalition Ranch. There's two years of remediation and two years of surveys. The Racetrack Pond, uh, this is the first year for remediation. We've got three years of data before they did anything. Private property in phase eight, we have two years of surveys. But phases nine through 14, there is no remediation and there's no surveys being done. So, and then phase 15 and 16 is Grant Coors, and I've done three years of surveys there. But what we've got is we've got some of these, we have pre-remediation data and some of them we don't. And so they didn't really, they contacted me and said we made a real mistake. We started digging, moving dirt before we had any bird surveys done. And so we've, we've made up for that in some places, and other places there's nothing we can do about it. I think I went two slides. In terms of bird species in the upper Clark Fork, and this is lat along 27C that goes from Butte to Garrison, the Continental Divide, to just west of Anaconda, I have identified 262 species of birds. At Warm Springs WMA, I've, I've identified 250 species, and then I've been doing research for ARCO in a new area called the Dutchman. 
and the Dutchman lies behind the, uh, the Warm Springs Hospital over to the highway that goes from Galen to Anaconda. And in that area, in uh, four years of surveys, I found 120 species. And there's 434 species in Montana. So what we're seeing is over half of the birds that exist in Montana exist from Butte to Garrison. Okay, so we, we do have a rich area and I want you to keep in mind the Dutchman wetlands at 120 species because it is land that was overgrazed but it was never uh, involved in any heavy metal stuff. So what I do when I go out and do a survey, it's called a point count. I go to an area, I wait 20 minutes, and then I've kind of learned how to imagine in my head what a 40 meter circle looks like, and I record every bird I see for 10 minutes. And I uh, record whether I find them in the circle, fly over the circle, f uh, fly through the circle, fly over the circle. And that's kind of, if the bird is pretty close, he flew through the circle. If he's really up there, he flew over the circle. And then uh, birds I heard but I didn't see, and then birds outside the circle. When I do my surveys, it's between April and June. Uh, we have 12 point counts in nine phases that I work with. We do 12 surveys during uh, April through June. So I get 144 point counts per season, and then we evaluate that data. So that's uh, where we're coming from. and. Uh, this one here, I wish it was a little darker in here than it is, but uh, this is phase one, which is the state land, state land, uh, this is uh, private land, and uh, that's, that's the Lampert Ranch. This, this, this one here is uh, phase five is uh, the Clark Fork Ranch, phase seven is Racetrack Pond, phase eight is uh, private land again and then phase 15 is the National Park Service and this is the number of species that I've identified in each of those areas and some of that is post and some of that's pre and there's nothing we can do about it so every phase doesn't have the same number of species depending on whether there was a pond there or depending upon the plant climb uh, the plant uh, complex when you remediate, you leave the stream bed alone. They're not touching the stream bed. They remove all contaminated soils as much as possible and replace with clean soils. Contaminated so soils are stored at the Opportunity Pond Depository. Um, that's directly east of Anaconda. And uh, we're ruining that land. So we compensated that by developing the Dutchman. This land here is 6,000 acres. This land here is 6,400 acres. And uh, it's a beautiful area. It's got the largest fin in Montana in it. A fin is where water comes up out of the ground naturally. You can go out there and walk and it's like you're walking on a, uh, a mattress. And uh, we're kind of using that as a comparison area for the work that we're doing on the river. They also lowered the floodplain. So much sediments came down the valley that it actually raised the valley and dropped the, well the river didn't drop, but it looked like the river dropped because the banks were so high. When the banks are that high, the water can't flood, get out into the alluvial plain. Cottonwood particularly needs flooded uh, areas in order to reseed. And also, if the water doesn't get out, then in late summer, the water can't migrate back in and keep the flows up. So one of the things that they did was lower the floodplain in wherever they did that. There's some controversy with that. Uh, Clark Fork Coalition says they didn't lower the floodplain far enough. But if you lower it too far, then you get too much of a flood. And you know, those are just the kind of things that happened. They stabilized the banks on the river. Wherever possible, they put new ponds in. Between, by the time they get the Deer Lodge, there's going to be about 15 new ponds that never existed before along the Clark Fork River. And I'll show you some pictures of those. Uh, here's what the river looks like right now. You can see there is plant material there. Uh, there's several species of salix uh, there. And then there is some vegetation, but uh, Robert would know more about this than I do, but most of that is a, is a grass called Indian rice grass. And Indian rice grass seems to be very tolerant to heavy metals. 
And then here's another uh, picture of the river. And you see this area here? That's what they call a slicken. And uh, that's really contaminated. Uh, it's actually after a rainstorm and the rain evaporates off the soil, it'll be blue. Those spots will be blue. And, and we're talking about 1908. You know, so it just keeps leaching in. Now, once we get done with Reach A, where all the heavy contaminants are, from Garrison to Missoula, they are going to reduce the price of, of what it does because they're not going to do what they're doing in the Upper Valley. They're only going to clean the, the known slickens. They're not going to remove all the soil like they have in Reach A because it's just impractical. Okay, let me ask you this then. They're going to remove that? Remove what? Those slickens? Yeah. Yeah. In some places, they've gone down six feet. Oh, really? Yeah. And you have enough money to do that? Well, they only got 77 million left. Yeah. You can see what's happening. Okay. I, mean, I mean, it's expensive to move soil. Remember that, I don't want you to go back to it, but remember that slide you showed where the, where the river was red? Yeah. Is that still a dead zone today? No. Oh? No, no. No, uh, it's still prone to have intermediate fish kills due to heavy uh, thunderstorms. But there are, there are uh, fish all the way up through the Clark Fork today. And then we did some pond remediation. Uh, this is Racetrack Pond and I worked on this one with the engineers on this. And I said one of the things we're critically short of in the Deer Lodge Valley is uh, spring and fall shorebird habitat. And so what they did, they designed these ponds. This pond before, here, here was the bank and he went like that and here's the water. Now we've taken all those banks and we've moved them like this. So no matter what the height of the water is, there's shorebird habitat. Because some shorebirds need an inch of water, some need two, some need four, none need 15 feet. Okay, and that's what we had before. So they remediated this pond by taking the banks and really gently moving them. And we also uh, put some fingers out into the pond uh, to even increase the shoreline uh, for that to happen. And then we also built some new ponds. This is a pond that's one year old. You can see how we uh, made that uh, very gradual shoreline here. And this pond is three years old. And you can see that the emerging vegetation has come back very well. The first year we had huge problems with this one. They planted all this emerging vegetation. They stepped back, looked at it, and said, that's really nice. And the geese came in and ate it all. You know, and you, you're trying to help the goose, you know. And he helped himself. So here you can see where we're lowering the, the uh, alluvial uh, Deposits looks like maybe three to four feet of deposit here. All that was taken to the opportunity ponds. Here you can see how far the reach is. They actually reestablished this oxbow. This oxbow was non-functional and they did open this up here and the stream goes this way and also this way. The, one of the big issues is once you remove all that dirt, where do you get new dirt that's clean? And some of the ranchers in the Deer Lodge Valley are making good money uh, selling the state clean dirt. Uh, here's the uh, river itself. They put in stabilization along the edge. You can see uh, it's really come back. And the first year, this was just like this tabletop. This is the third year. Uh, here's a picture I took. This is the second year. And in this next picture, you can see we, they put in a lot of willows, aspen, and cottonwood. And they protected those uh, for the first two years. And then after two years, they've got to come in and remove all that. And whether the deer leave it alone or not, we'll have to find out. How did you protect it? They protected them with plastic screens around them. Okay. So then, uh, this is the years since remediation. And then this is riparian. Rep uh, this one is pond riparian, 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 pond riparian, pond riparian, grassland, and pond riparian. And these are the birds of prey. And what this graph says is if I went out there and found this bird here, which was an osprey, every time, then that would be a value of one and it would cover the whole thing. If I found it in the case of the, of the osprey, 
it went from here to here, which is about 0.7. It means seven out of 10 times that I went there, I found this bird. So what we're seeing uh, on the river is that there's a variety of species in each of these. And so what we're, one of the conclusions we're coming to, we can't compare one area to the next area. We can only compare one phase to the same phase over time. Unfortunately, some of these phases don't have pre-remediation uh, data. And that's going to be a problem we're just going to have to live with. But one of the things you can pick up here is like we've got northern harriers in quite a few of the sites. Blue is red-tailed hawk. We've got red-tailed hawk in some of these sites. And we don't have the funds, but maybe I could get Stella to look at our information and uh, get some graduate student to try to figure out, you know, why is this bird found here and here but not here? You know, I have some just gut feelings about those kinds of things, but no, no real hard data. So, I'm not sure I understand the graph. Yeah, it's difficult. I can't see the This is zero to one. So that means that if the score was one, every time I went out to that phase, I found the bird. Right, but you added birds on top of each yeah. other. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't see why none of the bars add up to more than one. Because if half of the time you saw a red-tailed bar, and ha maybe a different half of the time you saw a bald eagle, yeah. and then another a third of the time you saw yeah. an osprey, yeah. Well, you know, I got a real good excuse for this. Um, I turned my data. Yeah, I turned my data into a company called Respect out of Missoula, and they analyzed the data. And when they sent me the data back, I went, "What? This is the most awkward graph in the world." Right. It is. This is not how I would have done it. Right. But I. By the time Robert asked me to do this and the time I had to get this together, I used their grasp. But I would not ever have done this. All I can say is in this particular phase, which is a what? Pond. Pond. Seven out of ten times that I went there, I found an osprey, which makes sense. Yeah. Right. But this, this is an awkward way to represent the data. That one time out of 20 that you went there, you found a red-tailed hawk. That's right. But it's only one time out of 20, that's not very many times. That's right. So then, the interesting thing will be, four years from now, because this pond here just got remediated um, this last fall, no, this last spring, will that change? I think you have to put those data together in a different way in order to get You know what? You're not going to get any argument from me. And uh, actually, I need to get a whole... I have given, yeah, I have given my 2018 data to respect and uh, I need to talk to them about, we need to redo these graphs so they mean something. I don't, I don't respect them, I don't think. <laughs> but, you know, here's the interesting thing. In the first two years, I did the analysis. And then the third year they said, well, this isn't, it. the way you're doing it is not the way the state wants it. So you provide the raw data, and we'll put it into the form the state wants. This is the form the state wants. So one out of 20 times you go there, there are no birds? Well, if you add up, uh, well, up yeah, this, this actually is here. What it's saying is 95% of the time that I go there, I see a bird. A uh, bird of prey. A bird of prey. Right? Right. So that means one out of the times, one out of 20 times you go there, don't see any I don't see a bird of prey. So, I mean, if you spend a lot of time on this, it starts to make sense, but it's no way to communicate with the public. No. Okay? So then, but you can see that along the Clark Fork, uh, there are quite a few birds of prey. That's one thing we've established. And then the other thing we've established, remember I told you on the Dutchman we saw 120 species of birds? We found 115 through the 2017 data. They haven't analyzed the 2018 data, but I know that in 2018, I found at least six or seven species I hadn't found before. So we're, we're at 120 species in the Dutchman, and the, which is an alluvial willow complex, 
and then you go over here which is about three miles away to the river and I'm finding 115 species it means I'm finding most of the species and that's really encouraging to me that we are actually getting at everything that's there well let's take another one of these uh, groups on a poor slide okay these, th this is the waterfowl um, right yeah <laughs> Yeah, see, you know, so what I ended up, and I knew all this was going to happen to me, what I ended up saying was that just look at the numbers. You can see that in terms of waterfowl, uh, wherever, that this pond here has more species than any other pond, and that's true. And this big blue one right here is uh, green winged teal, and that's a misrepresentation because they are there. But blue winged teal don't stay in the valley, and the contract is from April, May, and June. If I did this in July, August, and September, the grass would look entirely different. But that's, here, here's what really happened. This is what the state is required to do for the federal government, so that's what they did. Okay, and you know, you can be critical of that if you want to. I'm just a contractor who's saying, I'll provide you the data within the conframes of what you asked me to do. So, Gary, I can do ponds or live for birds from your graphs. I can do ponds or live for the birds. Yep. Now, here's, but here's the interesting thing. How many years Yeah, again, but. Ponds are good for birds. Right, but. Five years from now, when we have a lot more data, and we start looking at, because this is, this is pre-remediation, will this bar graph look different five years from now? Have we changed the species because of what we did? And did we change the density or richness because of what we did? And, and, and I hope that we use a different graph when we do that. Because the reports I sent in were a different graph, but I only had two years data, and this was three years data, and I thought I should show you the three years data. But if you look at that, we've got a lot of waterfowl in the valley. Okay, the next one is shorebirds, and I, I'm really interested in this one. We didn't have a lot of shorebirds at Racetrack Pond. I think we'll just pick on Racetrack Pond. We didn't have a lot of birds in Racetrack Pond compared to this one, but here's the interesting thing. This is a pre-remediation data. This one here is a pond that was built in the post-remediation, and it's in its third year of post-remediation plant life. And so this pond far exceeded the expectation of this pond. That's encouraging, because we're short on shorebird habitat in our valley. So that's one conclusion you can draw from this. And I, you know, I, I take, because of the way you're hassling me, I take real comfort in the fact that I didn't make these graphs, okay? But you can draw some conclusions. I don't even know why we bother with pigeons and doves, but uh, we did simply because I found them. And the one thing you can say, there's more rock doves, uh, well, there's probably more morning doves in the valley than there is anything else. The reason, uh, Rock doves don't show up is because they're more of a city bird. Another group is coots and sandhill cranes. And again, I don't know why they grouped it that way. I wouldn't have grouped it that way. Um, but you can see, again, this. whenever you have a, a water bird, it shows up here. This one here is a misrepresentation. Right over here, ge geographically, is the Warm Springs Ponds. And so these birds are flying over phase one all the time and I'm recording them and so this is kind of false data because they show up because I can see them flying over but it doesn't mean they're in it and what I really need to do is sit down with the state and say hey guys you know what data do you really want and am I giving you what you want uh, so far I haven't had any complaints but I haven't had that conversation with them either Okay, these are corvids. That's the raven, the, the black-billed magpie, and the American crow. You can see that the black-billed magpie pretty much exists in all of the phases. Um, but if you kind of look at this, maybe there's a pattern between post-remediation and uh, no remediation yet. Lots of ways to look at this data. Okay, now these are the passerines, the little birds that perch. These are all the sparrows. 
And again, you can see that the sparrow that shows up the most is, is the savanna sparrow, and then that's probably followed by the uh, vesper sparrow, and that's my experience from just birding in the valley. But uh, again, these graphs tend to be really high, and you could almost make a conclusion, and then you get to this one, and it's almost as high, and we haven't done anything yet. So that's why I'm saying you can't compare this stuff one to another. We're going to have to compare each phase to itself over time. Uh, here's the swallows. Again, we can say there's a lot of tree swallows in the valley. Uh, why didn't we get uh, a lot of swallows here? Well, that's mostly, uh, these two sites are mostly grassland sites. Uh, th they're a dry riparian site and these birds want to do insects. Uh, here's the blackbirds, which includes the yellow-headed blackbird, western meadowlark, uh, red-winged blackbird, bullock's oriole, bobolink. Let me just talk about bobolink. Bobolink is the orange one, and it only shows up right here. And that's in phase 15, which is the uh, Grant Corps National Historic Site. Bobolink, if you're familiar with that bird, it's a black bird with a yellow patch on the back of its head. It has to have very deep, tall, wet grass to nest. And they are nesting on the Grant Coors Ranch because the hay fields extend right into the Clark Fork River. Now the problem is the bobolink is a bird that's in trouble in Montana because when guys do haying, they kill them. Okay, so we get a lot of birds coming in and nesting and then a circle bar is really hard on a nest or hard on the bird. And I did do a project for Grant Coors and I said, look, we could prevent this problem. It's not that hard to do it. If you know anything about haying, you start on the outside and you hay like this and you start mowing and you keep going around and around until you finally get it done in the middle. What does that do to the birds? It pushes the birds to the middle and then you get them good. Okay, All you got to do is waste a little hay, go to the center of the field, and start mowing out. And if you mow out, what happens? You keep kicking the birds out, kicking the birds out, kicking the birds out, and they finally get to the edge of the deep grass, and there's nowhere to go, so they go up and go back to the middle, which has already been mowed. And we got grant cores to do that. Okay, And now, could we talk ranchers into doing that kind of thing? I don't know. We're talking about a project, I work on the Berkeley Pit problem with birds, and we're talking about a lights out program. Would a lights out program to save white geese fly in Butte? I don't know. Might. What's the value of the community? Would they be willing to be inconvenienced with lights out when the white geese come through? I think that would be convenient because we have better views of the stars. Yeah, but do you represent anybody besides you? Yeah, I don't know either, see? Yeah, right. So, I mean, obviously you're a concerned citizen, but you know, uh, is Joe Blow that concerned that he would do that? When the Germans and, and the Japanese had subs off the coast of America, we had lights out. But maybe that was a, more of an impact than this. So the, the next one is, war, is warblers. And uh, here we see that the uh, yellow warbler is present in a lot of these, uh, but we had one phase where we didn't have any warblers. And here's the, 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 the thrushes and the wrens. Again, you can, one of the, the way we're looking at the data so far, we can certainly determine which ones have the highest population. And one of the things we want to do is 10 years after we've done all this and spent all this money, and by the way, the average cost is $40,000 an acre to get this land cleaned up. What's the value of ranch land? Less than 2,000 an acre. Okay, um, so you know you can argue that one, but what we want to know is are we getting more birds of the species we had or are we getting new species? That's why I'm such an advocate of cottonwood because there are bird species tied to cottonwood that are not in the upper Clark Fork. And one of them is the Lewis's woodpecker, y you know. If, if you called me and said, I found a Lewis's woodpecker, and, and I said, where? And you said, well, just outside of Butte, I'd say, you're wrong. They don't exist. Did they used to be here? Yeah, they used to be here. Now, if you get to Missoula, where there's a really good 
Cottonwood Riparian Complex, you can find Lewis's woodpecker everywhere you look. But that's going to be real success when we get to that point. Well, we, you know, might not be in my lifetime. Uh, here's uh, uh, just a group of other species that we're gathering data on. The gray is uh, European starling. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> That's an in invasive non-native species. Uh, here are the large water birds. You can see that uh, one of the ones that really uh, is around is a double crested cormorant. Now this is interesting. Does that say that we have produced habitat that's good for double crested cormorants. No, because over here is Warm Springs Ponds and there is a breeding colony of 70 to 80 double crested cormorants and they move away from the Warm Springs Ponds to feed, but does this data show that as you get further from Warm Springs, the numbers drop off? That may be all it's showing. It may have nothing to do with the remediation and what I'm trying to tell you is you look at the data and you can generate more questions than you can generate answers. Okay. And here's woodpeckers. Obviously the northern flicker really dominates along the Clark Fork. And now here's the species of concerns. A horned grebe, white-faced ibis, American white pelican, bobolink. I picked out and talked about that one. Common loon, look at the number of common loons at the Warm Springs ponds. Why don't we have them over here? No habitat for them. But we do have a pond at uh, Grant Coors and we do get them to show up there. So, you know, there's just so many ways we could be looking at this data and uh, the data belongs to the state of Montana and anybody's free to pull that data down off the website and analyze it in any way you want. So the conclusions I have. Not enough time yet to see if remediation resulted in higher densities or diversity or richness to the phases. Phases do not all have the same abiotic biotic factors. Thus comparison between phase, phases is not valid. A single phase will have to be compared to itself over time. Some phases lack pre-remediation monitoring and that's so it's going to be tough to say anything about those and the key to new species lies in the establishment of a cottonwood riparian complex in my opinion and how old does a cottonwood tree have to be before there is an avian response? I don't know. And uh, this is the first time I've ever given this presentation. And the funny thing that's going on in my mind is I'm generating all kinds of questions that I never thought about before. Simply because the data doesn't draw any conclusions yet. So let's open it up to questions. We have a few minutes. Thank you.